Today we rule Germany. Tomorrow the world. What kind of talk was that? It must be only hot air. In 1935, about the time you had your first date, we read that strutting Mussolini had attacked far off Ethiopia. The disease seemed to be spreading, so Congress assembled to insulate us against the growing friction of war. We want no war. We'll have no war. Save in defense of our own people or our own honor. Toward this end, our chosen representatives passed the Neutrality Act. No nation at war could buy manufactured arms or munitions from the United States. In 1936, when you were running around in jalopies, we were disturbed by news from Spain. In our newsreels, we saw German and Italian air forces and armies fighting in Spain and wondered what they were doing there. For the first time, we saw great cities squashed flat, civilians bombed and killed. In November 1936, the American Institute of Public Opinion, known as the Gallup Poll, asked a representative cross-section of American people, if another war develops in Europe, should America take part again? No. 95%. We the people had spoken. 19 out of 20 of us said, include us out. To further insulate ourselves, we added a cash and carry amendment to the Neutrality Act. Not only wouldn't we sell munitions, but we wouldn't sell anything at all, not even a spool of thread, unless warring powers sent their own ships and paid cash on the line. In 1937, the press services received a flash from Asia. Japs were turning Asia into a slaughterhouse, but for us, Asia was still far away. In September 1937, the Gallup poll asked us, in the present fight between Japan and China, are your sympathies with either side? We answered, with China, 43%, with Japan, 2%. Undecided, 55%. We hadn't made up our minds about China. Our Neutrality Act barred sales of armaments only to nations at war. The Japanese had not declared war, so we went right on selling scrap iron and aviation gasoline to Japan. In March 1938, Hitler had not declared war either, but his goose-stepping army suddenly smashed in and occupied all the soil of Austria. Six months later, Hitler and his stooge met the anxious democracies at Munich. Hitler promised peace in our time if Britain and France would give him that part of Czechoslovakia known as the Sudetenland. Britain and France gave him that part of Czechoslovakia, hoping to avert war. Now we had his word, peace in our time. At home we began to hear strange headlines. We sat in our theaters, unbelieving, as motion pictures exposed Nazi espionage in America. As Germans, we know that if America is to be free, we must destroy the chain that ties the whole misery of American politics together. And that chain is the United States Constitution. Could these things really be? 
Yes, these subversive acts were happening in real life every day. German-American bonds organized for the purpose of destroying us marched under our very noses. I pledge on the violence allegiance to the flag of the United States of America as a republic for which it stands, one nation indivisible with liberty and justice for us. In our press, we read the news from abroad that Nazis were spending millions, arming Germany to the teeth. We read that the Tokyo Diet was appropriating tremendous sums, converting Japan into one vast munitions plant. We watch these supposedly poor, have-not nations spend huge sums for armament, and we wondered why. Arrogantly, they told us why. They had declared war on us long before the shooting started. We have actually been at war since the day when we lifted the flag of our revolution against the democratic world. The Germans are noble and unique race to whom the earth was given by the grace of God. The world must come to look up to our emperor as the great ruler of all nations. When the people of these three nations elected to follow their leaders, Death Incorporated, they organized to smash personal freedom, equality of man, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, organized to smash the very principles which made us the people we are. So in December 1938, when the Gallup poll asked us, should the United States increase the strength of its army, navy, and air force? We answered yes, 85%. It was time to look to our defense. Gentlemen, this is the Military Affairs Committee of the United States House of Representatives meeting for the purpose of considering national defense. The Navy is asking for an increase of 25% in authorized naval tonnage in view of the grave international situation. Congress, reflecting the voice of the people, appropriated the largest sum for military use ever voted during peace in American history. We didn't dream that a few years later it would look like peanuts. On March 14, 1939, Adolf Hitler broke the pledge he made at Munich. He took over all the rest of Czechoslovakia. There would be no more peace in our time. April 7, 1939, as we here in America observe Good Friday, Italy attacks Albania! The picture was becoming clear. The conquering forces of violence were being set loose in the world. Where would they stop? In a last desperate effort to avert a world war, President Roosevelt, as a neutral, sent messages to Hitler and Mussolini, asking their promise to respect the independence of 30 free countries. To Adolf Hitler, this message was a huge joke, as he repeated the names to a jeering Reichstag. Sweden, Denmark, Niederlande, Belgium, Großbritannien, Irland, Frankreich, Portugal, Spanien, Schweiz, Liechtenstein, Luxembourg, Poland, Ungarn, Romania, Yugoslavia, Russia, Bulgaria, Turkey, Iraq, Arabia, Syria, Palestine, Egypt. This was the only answer the president received. On September the 1st, 1939, the Nazi army smashed into Poland.
Sweden and France had a treaty with Poland. Would they act now? Adolf Hitler's all-out attack on Poland makes the long-dreaded European war a certainty. Prime Minister Chamberlain of Great Britain gave the Nazi dictator a zero hour for withdrawing his troops from Poland. That zero hour ends now. At this time, we transfer you to London for an important announcement by the British Prime Minister.